Speaking of doing proper maintenance on an aging infrastructure, it's inspection time for the mighty Luscombe. So unfortunately, she's down for her annual inspection. And one of the smartest things I did right after high school is I went to a A&P school, Airframe and Power Plant Mechanic School, and uh, have been working on maintaining my own airplanes ever since, working under the uh, direction of a uh, authorized inspector, an AI. So, but we got another Luscombe. We got three Luscombs on the field. We'll go uh, jump in Doug Johnson's Luscombe and take a look at the Oroville Dam today. And the big news that we're watching now is, did they get enough debris out of the debris field at the base, at the um, Thermalito Diversion Pool, at the base of the main spillway, to open up that main spillway? They're going to open that main spillway up probably tomorrow or the next day in order to bring that water level back down in the Oroville Reservoir. I'll have the real-time uh, specs here. I'll give them to you on the voice over of our flyover. We'll also go downstream on the Feather River and take a look and see how those farmers fields are impacted uh, with the current water level in uh, the Feather River. So it's Wednesday the 15th of March. Let's go take a look at Orville, Orville Reservoir before they open up the main spillway for the first time since they've cleaned out the diversion pool. This is Doug Johnson's 1947 8A model Luscombe with a 90 horse combination. That is the sweetest flying Luscombe I've ever flown. It's well balanced, it's super light, has no electrical system in it and a lot of performance, all metal, and of course, highly polished. Super clean and sweet flying Lusco. And off we go, the dynamic duo in search of adventure to Oroville Dam. Note the fingertip touch, the light touch on the Luscombe Doug has. Just as a reminder and a point of reference, here's what things looked like just a couple of weeks ago before they began cleaning up this debris field, an estimated 1.7 million cubic yards of debris at the base of the spillway in the Thermalito Diversion Pool. And here we are arriving on scene at 3,500 feet over the top of the TFR, the Temporary Flight Restriction Area, which now has a top of 2,500 feet using again the GoPro Hero 5 camera. And look how much cleaner the diversion pool is now. And they've just about got that debris field worked back to the tail end of the main spillway. The Hyatt power plant still operating five turbines, turbines. <laughs> Uh, putting out about 12,800,000 cubic feet per second. As we bend around to the right, you can see the excavators on barges still working in the diversion pool. You can see the maze of new roads constructed to, to get down here to clean out the diversion pool. Just behind the wing strut, you can see the benches formed from the debris pulled out of the diversion pool, which should uh, slow down the flow of water if water ever is to flow over the emergency spillway again. But you can also see the new river canyon formed when that emergency spillway was flowing just up above the benches. A brand new river channel. As of today, 15 March, over 1.2 million cubic yards of debris have been excavated out of the diversion pool. As we approach the emergency spillway, you can see the armoring or the shot creek work laid down in front of that emergency spillway. It doesn't look like they laid down much shot creek as, uh, near that parking lot area. And that parking lot area is the area that I was very concerned about. Back on February 12th, when the water level topped the emergency spillway. Now looking at the backside of the dam and the spillway and the emergency spillway, the brown along the shoreline is some of the floating debris that they've already lassoed a bunch of that and carted it off. 
Lake levels right now are right at hovering around 862 feet, just two to three feet shy of their 865 arbitrary knock it off number, necessitating the need to open the main spillway. And despite the warm weather the last couple of days, inflows have been fluctuating between 15 and 17,000 CFS. And the seven day forecast looks for more seasonal rain and snow in the Sierra next week. Of course, everybody wants to know what caused this whole disaster, and it's going to take a long time to figure that out. In fact, just today, they only just formed the forensic team that's going to study this disaster and give us the full report. And that'll probably take a year for them to come up with that report. So I want to continue to avoid speculation as to what caused all this. However, I don't mind discussing factors that investigators are going to be looking at during their investigation. Here we are crossing over the main dam at Oroville, an earthen gravity dam, the tallest dam in the United States, the top elevation here, 922 feet. And this outer layer of the dam comprised of material brought up from the tailing piles downstream, which we'll take a look at in a minute. Now we're crossing right over the outlet to the Hyatt power plant where the Critical water level of the Thermolito diversion pool is at a perfect 225 feet, which submerges diversion tunnel number one and only halfway submerges diversion tunnel number two, allowing the Hyatt power plant to operate. And I can see that with my naked eye. I may not be able to see it here in this camera view. And this is going to be the important point to watch as they reopen the main spillway to lower the Oroville Lake level back down to 850 feet or less, is how much more debris is going to come out of the main spillway and, and plug up the diversion pool? How well are they going to be able to control the level of the diversion pool? And will they be able to continue to operate the Hyatt power plant? Or will that level rise to the point where they'll need to shut down the Hyatt power plant? Also, we're going to need to watch how much additional erosion head cutting is going to occur on the main spillway right where it's failed at the edge of the failure. Now let's take a cruise downstream and take a look at some of the rest of the Oroville complex and how all these pieces of the puzzle fit together. Above the water at the top of the screen is that table mountain area. Very interesting geology. Wildflowers and waterfalls. Here's the diversion dam at the base of the diversion pool. The water to the right feeds the Thermolito forebay and after bay. And the rest of the water goes straight back into the Feather River. And they've got that flowing right now at 7,200 CFS out of the dam into the Feather River only 1,500 CFS going into the four bays. So when they first reopened the Hyatt power plant, there a lot of the water was used to refill the four bays, which they'd been feeding off of to keep the Feather River alive during the shutdown. The second dam or weir, I believe, uh, feeds the fish ladder for the fish hatchery which is just downstream of the bridge here. Of course, this fish hatchery was evacuated during this whole emergency and these fish relocated. Of course, a fish hatchery is required at the base of a dam because no longer can the um, migrating fish like salmon and steelhead continue upstream any further. This is the massive tailing pile area where most all of the material needed to create the Oroville Dam came from. They built a railroad from here up to the Oroville Dam to get the, to move the material. In the background, you can see the Thermolito forebay to the right and the Thermolito afterbay to the left, and in the middle is the Oroville Airport. What do these tailing piles come from? Well, long after the gold rush, most all of these Northern California rivers in the flatlands were dredged for gold using these huge floating gold dredges and processing plants. These huge floating gold dredges created their own ponds to float in and were electrically powered and were able to mine the fine gold that was left behind after the gold rush. 
here's a cutaway view of how this dredge worked, and it left behind nice uniform tailing piles in its wake. These operations proceeded here on the Feather River, down on the bottom of the Yuba River, and on the bottom of the American River, and this dredge can still be seen in Marysville today. And here's where the water comes out of the Thermolito After Bay back into the Feather River. So when you're looking at those river release numbers on the data sheet, it includes this water coming out of the After Bays back into the Feather River. You can see the ponds in the tailing piles below there, and I've heard reports of biologists recently going back in there trying to rescue fish out of these ponds that aren't even part of the Feather River system. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but that's not part of the Feather River, boys. This Thermolito After Bay is designed to be shallow and wide, and that allows the water to warm up, and some of this water then is used by the local rice farmers. Now let's go a little further downstream and see if we can see any of that um, levee failure problems. Well, we went pretty far downstream before I could see any evidence of cutting into the farmer's fields. And right about here where the wet river bends around to the right, I could see some evidence of the river cutting into this almond orchard here and dropping some of his trees into the river. But overall, it looks like the levee held up adequately. And of course, this kind of collateral damage was caused when they had to quickly reduce the flow of the Feather River from flood stage down to 2,500 CFS to effective emergency repairs on the spillway. And those water-saturated levees slumped into the lowered river. Bonus section here, just for fun, let's watch a retired airline pilot and former Navy puke, <clears throat> I mean pilot, uh, Doug Johnson, land his Luscombe in a pretty good crosswind here at Nevada County Airport. These light airplanes are a handful, these old tail draggers in a crosswind. It work, it work, it. Pinned it on, wheel landing right on the center line. And then they drop the tail on. Perfect. Good job, Doug. So stay tuned for the next big event, the reopening of the main spillway. How much debris are we going to extract from the main spillway? How much erosion are we going to get after all these repairs? Will the Hyatt power plant continue to be able to continue to operate or will too much debris pile up and hamper its operation? See you here.